this year and teaching and training each of us into becoming deeper as disciples. And discipleship to us is the intentional process of following Christ's words and deeds, to become like Christ, to draw others to Christ, and to transform the world. And so we've been going through each of these topics that are listed below to help us uh, wrestle with that a little bit and learn some skills around that and hopefully we grow deeper together. So today, we're talking about doubt. <laughs> How many of you have ever doubted? <laughs> How many of you ever had a question? Um, I think most of us, if we're honest, might answer that in the affirmative. And so I'd like you to kind of ground yourself now as we move into this time together in some of these questions that are on the, the board. So take a minute to reflect on um, a time of doubt or a time of questioning or maybe even a moment or a, a very long period of time. What were you feeling, thinking, or believing during this time? What messaging did you hear from the church, from your family, from friends? And then how did it impact your relationship with others, with yourself or with God? So take a minute just of self-reflection here to think about some of those times so that as we talk about what doubt and questioning can mean, you can connect with your own thoughts and experience of that. things they want to share from their reflection. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I've always felt like the Presbyterian Church is very open to questioning. Like the Presbyterian Church, generally speaking, all the Presbyterian churches I've ever been at, I feel like I've been mm -hmm. comfortable with questions and doubt. Yeah, there's space for that yeah. in your experience. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to my mom about her experience growing up in a much more fundamentalist church where questions were rejected and ground <laughs> upon where if you questioned you weren't, um, you weren't a good Christian or you weren't believing enough or there was something wrong with you. And so to have the experience of then being able to ask questions and to live into some of those questions can be really transformative. Um, so I'm not going to find you certainty in the next 40 <laughs> minutes. I apologize for that. Uh, but my goals are to help you understand the value of doubt and questions and faith, to connect with stories from yourself and others about the gifts of doubts and questioning, and then hopefully to identify some tools to help you uh, hold space for that doubt. So Tim Keller writes in The Reason for God, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. So doubts can teach us things, doubts can help us to actually build up strength. It's like when you're working out, you're breaking down your muscles so that those muscles can grow and be stronger. And that's what I would say doubt is about. So for those of you who experience doubt, and you've had a moment to reflect on some of those moments, what does doubt feel like for you? What are some of the images that come to mind when you're in the midst of doubt or uncertainty or stuck in questions? I think I felt, uh, when I feel doubt, I felt sort of two versions of it, and even sometimes at the same time. One, a numbness mm, that numbness. comes from yeah. doubt and not having certainty. But then the other side is, I'm feeling something and it's negative, it's fear, it's mm -hmm. guilt. Feeling like I'm doing something bad, but yeah. not feeling in a way that would preclude doubt. Yeah. So guilt and feeling bad, like you're doing something wrong. Uh, yeah. What are other people? Yeah. Fear. Fear. Fear of what? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're here to ask. I, I think it's fear that my understanding of God will collapse. Yeah. And 
and that feels very precious. Yep. And I don't want it to collapse. Yeah. Yeah, one of the books that's over on the, the shelf over there talks about the idol of certainty and how we hold certainty up, especially, I would say, in the Christian world as we know these things to be true, it's absolute, we should just trust and know this. And so when doubts can fill up, it can fill us with fear of what might my community say, what might I say, like what if this is all not real and, and how do I live with that? What about others? What does doubt feel like for you? There's a certain element of abandonment. Abandonment, yeah. What was that? Abandonment. So feeling alone or isolated, mm -hmm. like you're the only one who's experiencing this, or maybe you're the only one who has questions or doubt. Some of the words that came up for me were darkness, silence, isolation, falling, like falling away from something or falling into something, <coughs> desolation. Like you're in a tunnel, you know, sometimes when you're feeling down or depressed or when you're feeling doubt, there's just no light on either side. So it's like a train going through a really long tunnel. Um, maybe sometimes a mismatch. Like I believed that God was going to do something and he didn't, and, or I believed that my life was going to turn out this way and that didn't happen. So it's a mismatch of what I was led to believe with what I feel is actually happening. That can lead to doubt. Can feel like failure, like you were mentioning, or even just disappointment of like, oh, this isn't what I thought, or this isn't what I felt that it should be. And that's hard. It's hard to hold these these feelings, especially in a place where you're fearing judgment or fearing disconnection from the community that you're a part of. But I think what I hope again to talk about is that doubt and questions really help us to build up our faith together and with one another. I don't know how well you can see this picture. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a story about this picture. I want you to think about whether you believe me or not. Whether if it's a true story or if I'm making it up. So these are medals. You see thousands of medals there. Not quite thousands. Hundreds of medals. Um, and they represent the uh, Canary Breathing Championship in Yugoslavia. Somebody won all of these many years in a row. How many of you doubt that that's what they're actually are? Okay, so we've got three doubters. Everyone else believes me that these are the Canary Champion medals? Okay, great. So see, in our community, we have different experiences. Some people are like, that's ridiculous. That cannot be true, despite evidence here. And so what I will submit to you is that this is the Yugoslav champion of Canary Breeders <laughs> from the 80s. <laughs> so I was in... Um, I was in Slovenia this summer and went to this place and this guy grew canaries <laughs> for much of his life. And every year you have to breed a new canary. You can't submit the same canary at each of the championships. Um, so he was an expert at this and won all of these medals uh, for his canary breeding uh, expertise. So those of you who doubted, it makes perfect sense. This is a ridiculous story. But what happened was we saw these medals and we asked questions. We said, what are these about? Who are these for? What do they mean? And we learned about this man who's the father of Monica, who owned a little brewery out in, in front of her yard and we would go and have cheese and meat and wine and, and homemade beer. And so we, by questioning and by learning more about her experience, we built meaning. We understood where she was coming from and what her family was like and what canary competitions were like in the 80s. <laughs> Uh, we built understanding, we built that relationship, and so I look at this now and I see so much more than just a medal or just even that doubt of how could that be possible. So this is a picture of me and my cousin and two people in New Zealand. Um, this gentleman had no teeth. That gentleman looks like he lived out in the woods. <laughs> uh, and we were going bungee jumping. And these were the people who were going to help us with it. <laughs> Needless to say, I had questions. <laughs> and I had questions for good reason, right? I'm going to jump myself off of this bridge right here over the lake or over the river that was coming through. And I wanted to know, how do you test this? How do you know that I'm not going to die? Uh, what's your track record look like for this? Um, and so I asked questions so that I could build trust 
in these folks. I said, if you can't keep your teeth, how are you going to keep me safe? <laughs> and, and he did, thankfully, uh, because I saw that they weighed us and they measured the rope and they made sure that we had all of our uh, equipment in line. I saw the equipment was in good shape. And I built my knowledge about what was going on. I built my knowledge about the systems that they used to keep me safe, and that helped me to build courage so that I could jump off that bridge and survive. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Bungee jumping is great, by the way. I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> so, all this to say that doubt and questioning isn't the end of something, it's not kind of an error message. It's actually intended, I would say, and I would submit to you, to build connection, to build courage, to build relationship, to build depth in our experience of one another, in our experience with God. So Joan Chinister is one of my favorite authors, um, and she talks a lot about this in many of her books. Uh, one is over there, it's called Call to Question, and it's a spiritual memoir where she kind of explores different topics that have been really important to her over the course of her life, or the course of the four years that she writes about. Um, and Anything she writes is worth reading, so do check her out. Um, she says, The spiritual life is a walk into the dark with the God who is light that leads us through the darkness. And the darkness is a very spiritual thing. And then she also says, We don't deal with major questions once. We deal with them over and over again, each time, if we're lucky, understanding them differently, learning from them more, dealing with them better, until our vision of them clears, and our hearts calm. And so it's not an error, again, to have a question return, have a question be answered differently later on in your life, given your context, but it's rather an unfolding of your experience of faith and your depth of faith. Does this fit for you all? Does this resonate? Have you had periods of darkness where it's felt too dark? Have you had periods where you've seen a candle or a light and seen a little bit of hope, maybe recognizing that as God's presence in the midst of it? Maybe you recognize it just as a candle, and you don't think it's God. Maybe it's somebody else bringing that to you. I think this really helps, again, help us to make space for some of these questions, knowing that they bring depth, they bring connection, they bring life. So God invites challenges, questions, and doubt. I think most of the people in this room would be able to do a better uh, scripture expository lesson uh, about the people in the scriptures who have doubted, uh, but I've listed a few here. Abraham, Moses, Habakkuk, Mary, Thomas, Jesus. Uh, the Psalms are rife with doubt. Um, and then also in history, so St. John of the Cross went through his dark night of the soul. Uh, Mother Teresa even had many doubts, wondering if what she had done for her whole life was, was worth it. And God, in response to these challenges, questions, and doubts, meets, meets us and meets it with his presence, but sometimes that's imperceptible. So in the midst of doubt, I would say that we often can't see where God is in it until time passes or until somebody joins us or until we sit and hope and wait and see happening. Any thoughts or reactions so far to these ideas? I'm someone who likes to be completely convinced of what I'm thinking. Yeah. So I do a great deal of research and make sure that I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I may still sometimes be wrong, but at least I think I'm completely <laughs> You know what you're talking yeah. about, though. Yeah. And so it's, it's encouraging to me. One of my favorite parts of scripture is when Jesus is preaching and he says some things that disturb people, and a lot of people leave him. Yeah. And he turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to leave me also? And Peter says, where else would we go? Yeah. You know? <laughs> what else would we do? And, and Jesus is willing to work with that. It's not full assurance saying, no, Jesus, we have full faith in him too. Yeah. But he's saying, yeah, you're the best we've got, so we'll <laughs> <laughs> <Let's> do it. <laughs> and Jesus is okay with that. Yeah. And I would say that's kind of an artifact of maybe the modern American church, that that need for certainty and absolutism has, has come about. And I think that's a really nice example of knowing enough or having faith enough to take that next step, do the next right thing, or connect in the next way. What about others? I find one of the struggles in some of these examples is knowing what the limit to the toleration of doubt is. Mm -hmm. Because in some of those examples, some doubts are met with strong re rebukes. Yeah. If you look at some of the Psalms and some stories of Moses. I find that's 
a struggle when you think about your own doubts because mm -hmm. you don't have a feedback that they seem to interpret so strongly. So I'm being yeah. mm -hmm. We don't, I don't know that. I don't know what is the yeah. limit of okay doubt versus unacceptable doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there is and being open to hearing where that line might be, you know, of like, what, am, am I being rebuked in this? Is there a behavior I need to change or a way that I need to be different or illicit? While also kind of recognizing that God still loves us and God is there. And the story of these is not um, God cuts us off and that's it. It's invitation into that trust, into that next step, into challenging yourself to continue to believe in the midst of it. Yeah. Um, there was a book by Oz Guinness called Up Two Minds. Uh huh. And um, can you remember the Greek word that, it, that we use in the Bible all the time? I can't get it down, but it's, it means in Greek of two minds. Mm -hmm. Like doubt and faith. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. That was a really interesting book. Do you remember which word it I don't know. I know what you And so, kind of holding that faith and doubt are yeah. held together. Is that the idea of it? That that's yeah. normal. That's the concept. We yeah. use them by the Greek, true Greek meaning. Yeah. That's right. So I want you to find a partner around you or somebody, a few people who you can talk about some of these questions together for a few minutes. So the questions, there's a lot of them, you're not going to get to all of them. So maybe pick one or two that you feel like are good ones to go deep on. So one is just when have you had doubts? What's hard about doubting or feeling your way through the darkness? What sustains you in your questions about God or the world? What questions do you hold now? What are the gifts darkness has been in your life? And then what would it be like to celebrate the doubts and questions when they arise? So you can choose the level of depth that you share, whether you share what you're actually thinking or feeling or how you think about some of those things. Uh, but find a partner and take about five minutes here to, um, to explore that together. Yeah. 
praise you as a Okay, I see. So kind of that holding both, like you were talking about Galen, I believe that 
this is how God operates, and this is what I believe about him, and this is a really difficult experience that I'm having that doesn't align with that and holding those in just position. Yeah. It's terrible. We all do my thing. But um, I always come back to the God never promised it would all be good. He just said he'd be there with us mm-hmm. through it. And I still so struggle. Mm-hmm. I, I do when I see situations where it's just so cruel. I having had a grandmother who died in the Holocaust, my kid, I think about it every day. I don't understand where he was. And that's that darkness, the silence or the tunnel. I think that in reality, we live in this world we know to be very bad. There's so many bad things that happen when they're around us. And one thing that does is the depth of that badness creates a contrast of the greatness of the goodness. Mm. So the contrast of doubt and questions and tragedy and hardship with the goodness that we also see. So I have some thoughts about kind of what to do when you're in doubt. Um, And one of them is borrowing faith from others. So when you're not feeling faithful, you have people here who are, or who might be, or who have been. And so borrowing that faith, resting in that belief that I have believed at some point, or I might believe again at some point, and I know that this person is exhibiting faith in my life right now, and I can trust that if they're believing it, it might still be there. Uh, trusting in your own history of faith, or maybe, again, the history of somebody else, that you can say, this has been where I've been, and I'm not there right now, and that's okay, or that's a space I can be. Talking again about that either or, allowing questions and belief at the same time. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can believe and question, you can have (coughs) faith, and you can doubt all at the same time. It's not an either or, that you have to reject everything if you have one question about it. And recognizing questions and doubt as an opportunity for growth, not a failure of belief. I think that's another kind of pattern that often emerges is that we see ourselves as failures if we don't believe 100% or if we always are certain. Um, and then allowing disappointment, uncertainty, fear, tragedy to lead to questions and then therefore connection, hopefully, and that deepening of faith. <clears throat> Remember bungee jumping? <laughs> that fear and uncertainty can lead to questioning and can lead to understanding and can lead then to trust and to an experience of those things holding you. Read the Psalms. We have examples of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. So these ideas that you can be connected to God, and the Psalms will talk about that. You can be disconnected from God, and the Psalms will talk about that. And then you can talk about that journey of returning that is also represented in the Psalms. And so if you don't know where to go, start there. Read one a day. See how it goes. See what you're hearing and feeling. You might see your own story in the stories of the Psalms. And then tap into that bigger story of love, connection, social (coughs) and get outside yourself. I think a lot of times we get stuck in that idea of needing to have everything all put together, all decided and right and tied up in a nice bow. But sometimes going and serving or going and picketing or going and taking an action in some way can help us realize that it's not just about what's going on in our minds or our hearts, but God's working outside us and around us. That might help us to connect to what God's doing outside of our own individual life. So if you're really in doubt, (laughs) light a candle. Challenge that darkness. So take a physical action. That's why I have the candle lit over there in the corner. Share your questions with somebody else. So challenge that idea of isolation. Connect with somebody else. You know from your conversations you've had today that others question. And so if you can share your questions with someone else, you're going to help them feel less alone in their questions, and you're going to feel less alone in those questions. And then hold your doubt. Challenge the need for certainty. You don't need to resolve it in the moment. You can hold it together. 
and not fix it. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to do. So this is a quote from Kierkegaard that I don't really understand. I never expect anybody else here to understand, but we're going to start with it, and then I'll give you my translation of it. So Kierkegaard says, without risk, there is no faith. Faith is the contradiction of a person's inward spirit and objective uncertainty. If I were capable of grasping God objectively, I would not believe. But since I cannot grasp him objectively, I must believe. If I wish to persevere in my faith, I must constantly be intent on holding fast objective uncertainty, so that in the objective uncertainty, I am swimming in deep water and yet believe. So my translation is, <laughs> by knowing that I can't have perfect certainty, I then take a leap of faith and upheld in the depths of doubt of life and of questions. So the holding both and, letting that hold you up in the midst of it, the leap of faith. And Ben Young in one of the books that's over there, Room for Doubt, says, stop thinking about faith and start living it. So again, getting stuck in our heads makes us question and doubt and kind of go down that spiral and taking an action as if it were true. Like, what else am I gonna do? <laughs> Where else am I gonna go? Maybe I'll take one more step and see what happens. And then be notable observers of what comes into your life. Where you need to go next, what that next right step might be. So the one caution I would say, beware of staying in doubt and rejecting the rest offered by God. Um, in Isaiah, it, this is one of the um, quotes that keeps coming back to me after a sermon I heard probably 15 years ago. Um, it says, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. <laughs> I think sometimes we get caught in this need for certainty, need for moving, need, need for understanding that we can't just rest and we can't trust, and we can't be quiet. And a few verses later, it says, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, in the midst of you having none of it. Therefore, he'll rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. So remember that, even if you're learning a lesson, even if you're being rebuked, even if you're not sure, there is rest, there is quietness, there's trust in God. And finally, uh, Greg Boyd in The Benefit of Doubt says, your relative level of certainty or doubt, doubt does not improve or diminish God's love for you. So regardless of whether you see, feel, know, God's love is there to hold you in it. And he welcomes these questions, welcomes the challenge, welcomes the things that we will never resolve and meets it with love. And again, whether we can see it or feel it or trust it in the moment, is uncertain. It's a question. It's a doubt, right? But to know that that love is present, that love is there. And you can use your own experience, you can use experiences of others who have experienced that love in the midst of it to hold space for the doubt. So what, what questions, what responses, what's, what's on your minds right now as we near the end? Does this feel new? Does this feel hopeful? Does this feel hard? I read something once where that said, uh, God, God hears your cry of protest and your anguish and duck may not give you an answer, but will give you himself. Mm -hmm. And it fits in with that. Presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that doubt has a lot of similarity to um, humility. Mm -hmm. And so the opposite of that would be pride or extreme doubt that's really where we're like, I refuse to believe or be comfortable or this with this set of ideas until I resolve all the rubbishes and mm -hmm. things that I don't understand. And so a position of more humility. 
ability to say it's actually okay for not to be completely spelled out in my mind, but that I want to be on a pathway towards understanding, increased <laughs> faith towards resolving some of those doubts. For me, I think the, some of the doubts that I continue to deal with are actually doubts that only began when I was in my teens, mm -hmm. so I realized they came about mm -hmm. self-faith. And I feel okay about that, mm -hmm. even though I wish that I could just put the bow on and tie it up and yeah. um, so yeah. so, so long-standing doubts returning, kind of like judges or mentioned with the questions that they come back and you might have different answers or different ways of understanding those same questions you had when you were 15. Yeah. I, I just mm -hmm. I kind of experienced a gift of darkness when I was in the hospital. of our lives that remain dark and there are other parts that find light again and again holding both of those that it's not an all or nothing but being able to see and hold that darkness and grieve the loss, grieve the doubt, grieve the difficulty <coughs> but not knowing. Yeah. Well thank you for engaging in this conversation. I hope that it doesn't end here. Um, we will be continuing the Faith Cafe discussion with suffering explored this week. So uh, continuing this, and Lent starts this week, and so we have a little bit of a, a Lent series with suffering, journaling, listening to the spirit, lament, and silence and solitude. So kind of a more reflective and um, intimate, maybe, approach to some of these things. So please join us during that series, and you don't have to come to all of them in order to get something from one of them. Um, but if you would, please pray with me. God, thanks for the space to talk about doubt and to talk about questions today, for your presence here with us in the midst of that, and recognizing that some of us feel that deeply and powerfully, and some of us feel it faintly, and some maybe not at all. I pray, God, that you would help us to hold that space for one another and for ourselves, help us to lean into those questions so that we can develop courage and trust and faith and belief in you. Thanks, God, for all you're doing in and through us. In your name we pray. Amen. So continue the conversation leaving here. Invite your friends to join friends you. you. Um, and we'll see you yeah. next time. We have been to someone. Yeah, it was, we were talking about that. It was pretty interesting. People really opened themselves up. Yeah.